for me, I've got to have that wider purpose to the work because then that gives you reason and purpose for when it is tough and it will get tough. I mean, I think the other thing is be prepared for the knockbacks as well because it's not a straight path to the top. Mm. (laughs) Not in my experience, certainly. And life throws all sorts of things at you. So I guess that's the focus bit, you know, Mm. just stick with it. Stay focused on where you're trying to get to and why you're trying to get there. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 24 of The Art of Success. Hope you guys are having a rocking week. Uh, All good here. I'm about to head off on an epic holiday around Europe uh, for the next three weeks. So I'm excited about a bit of sunshine. Hopefully, wherever you are, you've had a bit of sun. I know in the UK, it is definitely stepping up its game. Um, So I'm happy about a bit of sunshine because it's been freezing. And I don't know about you, but I hate the cold. Anyway, uh, for those who haven't listened to the podcast before, The Art of Success, it's all about unpicking inspiration, tools and strategies for success in life. And I sit down with some incredible people who've just achieved some awesome things and really unpick from them, you know, what's helped them along their journey and try and share that wisdom. Um, Me, if you don't know me, my name's Ebony, call me Ebs for short. Um, I'm a former elite athlete, now I've moved into the world of broadcasting. Um, But one of my biggest passions is personal development, sharing, you know, ways of growing and developing ourselves and just getting the best out of ourselves and life in general. So if you've been enjoying the podcast, make sure you subscribe and pretty much everywhere, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, um, everything like Google Play, the world, it's just a press a button and it goes everywhere. So make sure you tune in on that. Now today I sit down with someone interesting. Last week's guest went down really well. I, I sat down with um, Claire, who was a friend that I knew from youngster, but she's gone on to become an amazing entrepreneur. Um, people just loved her insight and wisdom. And this week we've got another great guest for you, slightly different from the third sector. Today I sit down with Ruth Holdaway. Now, just to give you a bit of background about Ruth, she was named by The Independent as one of the 50 most influential women in sport. Uh, she took up the role as CEO of Women in Sport in November 2013. So she's been involved in this organisation for four years, which really is about um, looking at developing the opportunities for women in sport and accessing sport. And that's everything from grassroots, getting more girls playing and also tackling the bigger issues of leadership and governance and policy at the top end. So really looking at that flow. So, you know, she's really been involved in fighting for gender equality. She's had a 13 year career in the voluntary sector fighting for gender equality. She's had roles including breakthrough breast cancer, prostate cancer, UK and Women's Aid. So she's really been part of that. And also we delve into a little bit about her role in the NHS, one of her early roles, which built her determination and drive for social change and resilience. I always say there's a few things I like to like people to look out for in the interview. One of them, which I kind of start with her is that I I love seeing people who are an advocate for something. They want to see a change in society and they're prepared to put their time and their energy and their careers often into to fighting for that change and I just kind of tried to unpick from her what gave her that motivation and drive um, so we talk about her journey we talk about leadership in the role that she's currently in we of course get into gender equality um, but I, I really like hearing about that advocacy the, the key thing I would say listen out for which I find a fascinating trait I heard it in clear Claire last week and I've heard it throughout is this desire for creativity in careers I think that's what gives people that energy and that drive And she talks about moving on from the NHS uh, into other worlds and other parts of her journey. And that ability to be creative and find solutions is something that really gets her going. And Claire last week in entrepreneurship talked about how she really just sees the process of building a business as just a creative expression. You listen to Richard Osman, who was the... uh, a presenter as well as a uh, creative director at Endemol. And again, there was all this creativity. And I just wonder if that's something that's important to, you know, to try and harness within ourselves. I know one of the reasons I started the podcast is not only sharing inspiration, it's the ability to be creative, putting something together in the way that you love. And I just wonder if that's a trait we should all hone into. So look, there's so much goodness to take away from this interview. It goes through different waves and stages. Ruth is nice and open and bubbly as well. So no doubt you'll enjoy 
All right, first of all, Ruth, thank you so much for having me to, I would say, I would say your humble abode, but this is an epic building. Yeah, it's not humble. It's not, sure. is it? The, the House of Sport. The House of Sport, yeah. No, it's great to have you here. Thanks for coming. How long have you been, you guys have been based here for a while, have you? Yeah, so Women in Sport moved here last year, and um, basically it's an office building for lots of sports organisations, mainly charity, public funded organisations, so that we can all be based in one place, mm. we can see each other more we can collaborate more easily we can share some of our costs mm. and it's going really well it opened last year we moved in um in the autumn i think some people moved in in the summer so they got all the problems out of the way by yeah, the time yeah. we moved in it was all <laughs> sorted and lovely but yeah it's bright and colorful and you can you know, see across london as well i can see the london eye actually from where i am which is pretty cool up high on the fifth floor that's, that's a awesome. good view <laughs> awesome. well, more importantly yeah. thank you so much for having me in here um as you know i've been doing this podcast for a while it's a mixture of inspiration personal development and growth and I just love talking to some really interesting people and there's a lot of reasons I want to talk to you I've got I've done my research I always Uh-oh. do my research but <laughs> that <I'll>, sounds worrying <laughs> yeah I know about that thing no no I don't worry I know what you did last summer no I don't um just going back I mean you've had a brilliant career anyway of course you're CEO here at Women in Sport um just going back named by the Independent as one of the 50 most influential women in sport um and you took up this role about four years ago I remember the rebranding actually as did, well so yeah, you underwent right. all of that which we announced at Lords no less oh, so yeah. an immediate cricket connection I, believe. I was going to say also I did I did a little bit of branding back in the day there was this old yep. I don't know if you've seen it but it's an old cricket poster from the old branding yes yeah. so before I joined the organisation we were now called Women in Sport but we used to be called the Women's Sport and Fitness Foundation and I, when I came as chief exec, I rebranded the whole organisation with a new strategy. It was just time for quite a significant change. And we had a new chief executive and a new chair at the mm. same time. And that enabled us to kind of do quite a big review, I suppose, of where the organisation was, where it needed to go in the future. Um, but I had all sorts of things in the process of... Um, you know, revising the strategy, I was looking back through loads of the research the organisation had done in the past and lots of the comms materials. And I found these big, Mm. yeah, huge sort of boards that I don't know when they were made. They were made, must have been pre-2013. And the idea was they were done by Women's Sport and Fitness Foundation to showcase what they thought the media could look like in the future if women's sport was ever on the front pages so they mocked up um the front page of broadsheet newspapers this is what it would look like with female athletes so were you one of the athletes i was one of them i was one of the cricket i was was hoping you weren't going to say that's one of the reasons we rebranded saw it no (laughs) no because we thought that they were brilliant actually and i think we've still got them Mm. somewhere Mm. but what's really fascinating is it's not that long ago but it does show the change that we've achieved mm. because back then there'd never been women's sport on the front pages at all mm. and it doesn't happen often but at least it is occasionally happening now mm. and we're definitely seeing more coverage and you know it just I feel like it's not the kind of campaign we would necessarily mm. do, do these days it would be yeah it would be more nuanced than that mm-hmm. but you know back then and it's yeah, less than 10 years ago, though, yeah, so I'm saying yeah. it's not that long ago. But, you know, back then, it was just completely unheard of, mm. and those mock-ups were really kind of shocking. Kind of fresh at the yeah, time. Yeah, because yeah, no yeah, one had yeah, ever yeah. seen that before, yeah. so... Oh, how yeah, time's amazing. changed. I know. There well, look, look, I want to talk to you loads. I want to talk to you. I love talking a bit to the person about their journey a little bit as well. I'm really fascinated about people and how they've gone about their journey. And also, I wanted to talk to you more about things that are close to our heart about... Like I guess maybe a movement around women empowerment, women's sport is quite central yes. to that. Um, and also senior women in leadership, because yes. I think that's a, a fascinating topic, which is getting some momentum, but often, as we both know, there's still a lot of work to be done. Yes. Um, so I wanted to start, I'll tell you where I um, start. I always look at a quality in somebody that I kind of admire or would love to take a little bit or learn from. Right. And then that's kind of where I start a lot of the interviews. And Why is this making me nervous? No, Emily? don't be nervous. <laughs> Honestly, it's fine. You do it day in, day out. One thing that I would love to be more is like an advocate, a champion of something. Um, you know, I do a lot of sport and you support causes. Um, but to have that kind of energy to be out there and really like 
putting your name on something. And I think I researched yours and obviously you talked about um, being in part of the NHS uh, yeah. a while back. And that was your, you said there was something, a moment there where it kind of built your resilience and also your care for social change. That's kind yes. of when you shifted. Um, and now the work you do is all about wider impact and change and it's something I admire in you so (laughs) take me back to when you were there and what sort of shifted for you in your kind of career that's made you more conscious about impact and change yeah okay well the first thing is that makes me feel really old because I feel (laughs) like my time in the NHS was such a long time ago and time's a funny thing isn't it because it also feels like it was only yesterday it's really strange so yes I started out my career as an NHS manager and I went to work for the NHS when I graduated from university and I did the NHS management training scheme. And the main reason that I chose to do that was because I care passionately about social justice and I care passionately about um, public services. And when I was at university, I was quite involved in politics. And I felt that... I really needed to understand more about public services and I wanted to really kind of experience what some of the problems are and how some of those problems might be solved. So I decided to opt for working in the NHS and obviously the graduate training scheme there is a it's a structured programme over two years so I also thought you know that would give me a really good grounding in general management skills, um, which it did, <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, I, you know, I'm not ashamed to say I found it incredibly difficult. Um, NHS managers, as I'm sure you know, are not a loved species. Mm. It's really quite tough. Um, And you spend a lot of your time as an NHS manager saying no to things. So the clinicians want to develop services. They want to try, you know, they want to be innovative. There's new research that they want to implement in practice. And as the manager, you're holding the budget Mm. and there isn't much of it. And it's really challenging because, you know, obviously healthcare is expensive. Mm. And so there's scope for innovation and being creative to try and make something work without the resources. And I think that is a skill, a way of working that I've brought with me all the way through my career because I've stayed in the voluntary sector and there still isn't much Mm. money and you know we have to get really creative but I found the NHS yeah really challenging I worked in the NHS for about five years and I worked on a lot of change management projects I did things like working on reducing waiting times Mm. in hospitals I did strategic planning for older people's services I looked after paediatrics whole range Mm. of different things Um, But it's hard. It's really hard because you can kind of never do enough. There's always, you know, there are... Something to be done. There's always, yeah. yeah. And the decisions you're making can be life and death decisions. Mm. I mean, it's definitely... And I'm not a clinician, so directly I wasn't making life and death decisions. But you're aware that ultimately, Mm. particularly if you're working at the acute end of healthcare, so you're in a hospital and you're directly managing hospital services... You know, people's lives are changed daily because of these things. Um, and it doesn't always go to plan and, and things do go wrong and people don't always get well or they have the treatment and it doesn't work. And, you know, you've got to deal with all of those issues. Um, so, you know, as a 20-something-year-old first job, mm. it was pretty hardcore, mm. I have to tell you. Mm. Um, and I found... I mean, I... It reinforced my belief in a public sector. Um, Later on in my life, I went on to be quite ill myself and I needed the NHS and I'm so grateful for the care that I was given. And I think the NHS does amazing work on very little. But for me, I left and it was a conscious decision to move out of the NHS because I felt very constrained. I felt that... You could try and be creative, but there just wasn't enough creativity in the sector Mm. to um, really kind of drive innovation and change in the way that services are delivered rather than on the kind of medical side. So I stayed in healthcare for a long time. I moved into 
breakthrough breast cancer mm. actually from the NHS because I'd done a lot of work in cancer services but I just found in the voluntary sector there was just more freedom mm. and also through the advocacy work that charities do I actually found I was probably able to influence change on a greater scale within the health sector by being slightly outside of it mm. and influencing from the outside in rather than being a fairly junior NHS manager trying to make change from the inside Mm. it's quite powerful there's a few things I've picked up on what you just said actually one obviously is that theme or drive to want to have a change Um, but I love that word creativity because I think if you want to have an impact or influence you've got to look at unique ways I mean I've read a lot of your posts that you've done whether it's the Huffington Post or the Guardian or the Telegraph (laughs) and you're always out there putting new ideas and thinking creatively about how you can provoke thought is that something you consciously do or is it part of you as a person yeah I think so and you know I don't believe that more money is the answer to everything I think it's just too easy to sort of say well if we just had the money we could do x y or z I've always worked either in the public sector or in the voluntary sector where you just don't have massive budgets Mm. and you're trying to make huge societal change it takes time but it can be done But you do have to be creative, you do have to innovate, you have to work in partnership, you have to, um, yeah, find collaborators and other people who share your vision, you have to sell the vision, sell in the change that you want to see. Um, But I mean, that's what I love about what I do. I, I care about it, I suppose, because... It sounds really cheesy, but I am driven by wanting to make the world better. And that's what I get out of bed for in the morning. Not saying that that's what I achieve, but that's what I'm trying to achieve. Um, but also, I am a creative person. I am I mean, ask my team now. I'm a little bit all over the place. My brain is just constantly turning over. I probably have too many ideas. I throw too many things at them. But um, I guess that's why kind of the work that I do in terms of advocacy campaigning um yeah thought leadership you know women in sport does a lot of research so a lot of things that I will write about are based on the research that we've done and it's trying to share that research but also get people to think differently you know the world could be different there's different solutions to some of the problems that we have and I think I just have that sort of general creative drive Mm. within me so have you always been quite driven and I'm going to link this to a theme later but what about you personally have you been driven or is it more the cause that gets you going or is it a bit of everything and if you track back as far as you need to but um the truth is I think I have always been quite driven Mm. I don't think I've had a goal necessarily I think I really admire people who have kind of had a vision for where they want to get to in life and then they go for it and they get there I mean I definitely see that in a lot of athletes Mm. in the environment I'm in now you know you have a goal to play for England and you work really hard and you play for England you know or whatever it might be I'm going to win a gold medal and so you work really hard and you get there I've never given myself those goals and I could reflect on why that is. And it's probably partly to do with if you don't have a goal, you can't fail. Mm-hmm. So there's a little fear <laughs> hey, of failure little, thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's also probably a little bit about, I don't know, not wanting to maybe constrain myself mm. to going in a particular direction. Mm. Mm. So I think, I've, I, as I've said, I'm kind of driven by a social purpose. Um, and I want to... I want to do things that have meaning and purpose and I'm driven Mm. for that. And I think, you know, I get feedback from the teams that I've worked with that I do set high standards. I'm quite demanding of people, Mm. I think. Cracking the whip, are you? A little bit. (laughs) And I think it can be a good thing, but I also need to learn when it's, you know, not a good thing as well. And I acknowledge that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I always kind of say I'm ambitious for myself and I'm ambitious for the organisations and the causes that I work for mm. because the two go hand in hand. I don't separate them. Um, so yeah, and I'm just, I, yeah, try to be, I think mm. I've got a lot of energy. Mm. Um, so I just try to channel that in a positive way, mm. I guess. So how have you found, like, through your career, and I've spoken to different people who have worked, you know, I spoke to Matthew Patton, who's the CEO for Mayors Fund for London. How have you found the transition through your career into senior leadership roles? Have you, 
enjoyed it? How have you found the whole process? Gosh, that's a big question. Mm. Because, yeah, sometimes it's great and other times it's horrendous and Mm. difficult and really challenging. It's not been easy. Um, And I had a career break... Uh, When I was six, I had 14 months off work because I was not well. Um, And I had three operations and lots of hospital stays and so on. Um, So I also kind of understand about stepping out of a career and stepping back into Mm. it. And that's really challenging. And it was much harder than I could have anticipated. I definitely carry that with me. And I try to make sure that, um, you know, for anyone in my team that experiences something like that, and also for women going on maternity leave, mm. you know, stepping away from a career and coming back in, it's really important to provide support and enable people to do that. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest step to take, the hardest step to take, was the step to being a chief executive, actually, mm. for me. Um, just finding the right organisation, something that I could be passionate about. Mm. Um, in an organization that wanted me as well and then beating off all the other people that wanted that job you know that took a while and I I did reach a point where I knew that's what I wanted to do and I did decide I want to lead a charity Mm. um, and I actively sought that but I also knew having had many years in health and then having my own health issues that I didn't want to work in the health sector at that time anymore and making the transition to a more senior role, so trying to step up and move to a new sector at the same time, I found actually was impossible. Mm. And I think it's re- I think that's really interesting. And this is not a comment about me, but I think a lot of people can be very short-sighted when they're recruiting. Because I think there were plenty of roles that I could have done, but because I didn't have the expertise from that particular sector, mm. I was overlooked But if I think, you know, I started out in my career as an NHS manager and I was managing NHS services and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I've got no clinical background, it's perfectly possible to learn Mm. these things and work with experts. And, you know, I I feel sad in a way that I think one of the reasons organisations can become quite narrow-minded is because they just kind of recruit in their own likeness Mm. all the time. Mm. Um, I think actually that's part of the problem in sport sometimes is there's a lot of very sporty people working in sport and that's why Mm. sometimes other people are not inspired by sport Mm. because they're not talking to those people. So, um, yeah, it was difficult. And, I mean, it just is, you know, you give up a lot of yourself Mm. to be a leader. Um, You, well, I... um, yeah, I take it really seriously and I, I carry the responsibility and it is 24-7 and you know I was on annual leave last week but I had phone calls from the office mm. and uh, a couple of things that I needed to do that were you your phone ringing with them <laughs> it's fine this is a very real podcast by the way and just as I say that the phone <laughs> the rings. phone is ringing someone's on you hopefully it's not an emergency <laughs> it's not an emergency it can definitely wait brilliant so um, yeah it's hard yeah it yeah. is hard and it's they say it's lonely at the top <laughs> mm. and it's funny because I think until I became a chief exec I didn't really know what that meant but I do know what that means now um, because ultimately the decisions rest with me and there's lots of people that I can go to for support and advice but A, when the decisions are unpopular those some of those people kind of disappear um, and you know quite often you can be disliked Mm, mm. and I don't like being disliked Mm. but sometimes you have to make decisions that you know are not going to go down well and and that's you know if you're the sort of person for whom if you if you can let that kind of um wash over you a little bit I think as a leader, you sort of have to learn to have that quality about you. Matthew Patton talked about being prepared once your head goes above the parapet of dealing with the yeah the challenges that come with that. Yeah, I guess that's part of leadership, isn't it? It is, and it's you know I've reflected a lot on other chief executives that I've worked for, and I spent a long time in charities in senior roles, but not as chief exec. You know, being a director reporting into a chief executive, and I always thought I was fairly supportive and you know a good person to have in the team. And now I think, oh my goodness, if I'd only known Mm. then what I know now, I would have done things so differently. Mm. And there were times I'm sure when I made life really difficult for my chief exec or I didn't give the support that I could have done I didn't think about them enough but you know I'm 
I guess you can't really know that until you experience it yourself. So I apologise to all the chief executives <laughs> I've ever <laughs> worked <laughs> with. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No worries. OK, well, talk to me about some of the work you're doing now, because obviously Women in Sport, great organisation. Um, um, for those who don't know as much about it, but obviously you're, you're, you're looking at women in sport trying to, from all levels really, try and improve that, whether it's young girls getting the opportunity, whether it's more women in the boardroom. Um, how have you found this particular role... Obviously, you talk about enjoying the impact, but what have you seen over these last few years? And I say, actually, I'll start with what's attracted you to this particular yep. role or this, not, not so much a job, this particular piece of work that needs to be done in the yeah. world. Well, for me, this was a really, you know, I sort of said it was quite hard moving into a chief exec role because you know it's going to be all consuming. And if you're going to do that in a charity or maybe in any organisation, I can only, only have the charity experience, but you know you've got to I think really want to do it and really believe in it so finding the right organization the right cause is critical because you can't do this job half-heartedly you really can't so um when this role came up I just knew straight away that this was right for me and I think there are a couple of elements to it I have for many years been a passionate gender equality campaigner Mm. and I've sort of expressed that in different ways I worked at Breakthrough Breast Cancer that's all about you know quality health care for women primarily Um, and I worked for Women's Aid I was actually at Women's Aid when I came to this role so I had the experience I had um, you know passion for the cause and I I knew about it and also um, I'd for a long time you know, I, I admire athletes. I love sports. I'm a massive sports fan. I'm dreadful at sport myself. Um, I think I've said to you before, there's another cricket connection because mm. I went to school with Michael Vaughan. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was at school with very sporty people, elite athletes, and it's hard when you're not like that, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't think Vaughan ever picked me for a team in no, PE. No, I'll, I'll remind next time I see him, <laughs> yeah, I'll say, hold do. on, do you remember Ruth? <laughs> yeah, and I'm still just as bad as I was then. Um, you know, so it's... But I love sport, and as I've got older as well, I think I've done more sport, and I, I am kind of the classic woman that women in sport is trying to talk to. Um, it's not easy for me to be active, play sport, fit it into my life. Um, I'm not good at it but I do enjoy it and I do want to do it and I want there to be opportunities for me um but I also need for those opportunities to be the right ones so that I can feel confident about doing it Mm. um so I just kind of felt like I totally get it I totally get why fewer women than men play sport I think it's very complex but I just kind of was attracted to working in the sports sector um, fighting for gender equality through sport which is a fantastic vehicle for change Um, I thought my background in health as well would be really helpful because obviously sport is a big contributor to the health of the nation and having worked on sort of the treatment side you learn very quickly it's obvious really if we can prevent illness it will be so much better it will be cheaper for the country you know people will live longer happier healthier lives why would we not want to do that and sport has a really critical role to play and a role that is underestimated I think Mm. so it was just an amazing opportunity to be able to come to an organization like this um, it felt like a really good fit. So do you feel, I, I've felt, uh, and it's a weird kind of, <coughs> or not a weird statement, but it's a bold statement that I feel like I'm at a very unique part of history at the moment where you look and it's 100 years since women got the vote, but now you see sports moving forward. You look around and there was one point when it could have been Hillary Clinton, Theresa May. Oh, um, you yes. know, you look around and you think, yes. there are women at the, t- there are examples of the women yes. at the top. And you kind of look and you think there has been progress. But then yes. the other side is my experience being in environments. There are women who get to the top, but the sometimes there's still the challenge of getting masses coming through. And so I think there's a there's a excitement of seeing progress in front of yes. me directly. Then also maybe from the work that you do, there's a reality that even with all this going, there's still a lot to be done. Yes. 
I think you've articulated it perfectly. <laughs> Sorry, I've just taken out words out of your mouth. Sorry, the, yeah, yeah, the podcast is meant to be talking to yes, you. That, <laughs> Ebony, that is it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that it, that is the challenge, isn't it? And it's important to acknowledge the progress. Mm. Um, and it's important to acknowledge the progress in the sports sector. And we had a, you know, Women in Sport has lobbied, campaigned for a long time for more women in leadership roles in sport and it is now mandated that there must be more women in leadership roles for any organisation that wants to receive government money which means lots of organisations are fixing that now but it doesn't mean that the problem is solved it means we're taking steps in the right direction um but there are still but what are the barriers you know from your personal experience to what you're working in what 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 is the barriers to getting more of the, the masses coming through so there are just multiple <laughs> mm. barriers and it's not a, an easy question to answer, but I think probably the biggest barrier is culture. It's what we expect. It's what's normal. And, you know, if we take the sports sector, there haven't been many female leaders of national governing bodies. So if you don't see those women, if it's not normal to have women, there's a, I suppose, almost a kind of just attitude that that's not a role that women will do. And then when you combine that with, and this is not a comment about the sports sector specifically, because it happens across a lot of society, but you combine that with, you know, um, a lack of support for women to leave the workplace, have a family and come back in at the same level, for the skills to be, um, you know, to continue to be valued, mm. um, the cost of childcare. Um, Which is a killer. You know, yes. makes it really difficult mm. for many women. And this is talking about, you know, women who are working in, you know, probably middle class women working mm. in um, who have careers but what about women who work part time who have very little who maybe have to work what about the women who have to work two or three jobs just mm. to feed their family uh, you know there the challenges are, mount up there are so many challenges mm. and I think um, what's expected of women in terms of the imagery that we see in social media and what we're told is feminine and what isn't and um, you know there are there are many barriers I mean <clears throat> we've had organizations reporting recently on equal pay and there are you know, lots of uh, I think some of the data you know you need to give context to it but what we're we now have evidence of what we've always known, which mm. is that there's a massive pay gap between mm. men and women. Um, and when we start looking at equal pay for equal work, we're going to find there's also <laughs> a pay gap there yeah, as yeah. well. You know, and why? Why is that the case? Why have we kind of created a society over time where women are not valued for certain things mm. and not expected to take on certain roles? Mm. And that's what we're trying to challenge. It's it's huge, really. There's so many different elements mm. to it. I've got a few other observations just from my own personal experience. I, I do a lot of speaking, going out, and I did a talk um, the other day, and it's like empower women and blah blah blah. Get usually I try and just sort of do them up and and whatever it is. And at the end of the talk, I had a lady come up to me and say, "That's really nice, but I'm not about all that." I said, "What do you mean? Explain, break it down." She said, "I don't fancy putting myself through all that." And you talked about moving the higher you move up the chain the yeah. impact it can have and I, I there's two things I wanted to mention here is one I respect that for some people having to or you know as much as you might desire something actually putting yourself on the line is one thing yeah. the other thing that I find fascinating which I've mentioned to you before is the a lot of the women who've played team sport doesn't necessarily have to be a high level but have had a direct impact on senior leadership roles yes and that kind of fascinates me those two things of yes what your motivation and driver is maybe to go ahead and put yourself out there, but also knowing your influences as a young child, and hence yes. why a lot of what you do has an impact on what you want to put yourself forward for. Yeah, I think that I think it's really interesting actually, and I'm I'm increasingly thinking that actually sport does have this a much bigger sort of economic and social impact than we appreciate we did a piece of research a couple of years ago called sport for success 
and it looked at um, the impact or it tried to analyse the impact of playing sport at school for your future career. Mm. So it looked specifically at women which, as far as we're aware, had never been done before in the UK. And what we were really trying to do was sort of put a value on girls playing sport when they're young because it's saying if they do, they are more likely to contribute more to the economy in the Mm. future and therefore it's a good investment to make. Um, And what we found was that... um, women who are in senior manager roles are more likely to have played sport at school Mm. than women who are not in senior manager roles and women who are in management roles are more likely to still be active than non-managers and we also found that if you played sport at school as a girl your career will progress faster now obviously it's not true for everyone so but actually, if I do a sweep across my brain of people, like, women I can think in certain levels of management at a senior yeah. I would say all are, have been active, not necessarily athletes or anything like that, just have yeah. played sport, engaged in, you know. And the other thing that we know, and we haven't published this research yet, but every year for the last seven years, we've done an audit of the number of women in senior leadership roles in sport. And this year we decided to analyse more about the culture of of leadership in sport and and to understand more about how we could help women to progress. Mm. And one of the things that we found is, because we talked to men and to women, but things like networking. So we all know that networking helps you progress. Networking is a skill that you learn by playing team sport because you learn how to interact with others you also do a lot of your networking on the field of play and the men use that as an opportunity to talk to each other about work Mm. and the women don't and you know I think well we know that that is having an impact on therefore men getting jobs and having opportunities open to them and women not because women are not are literally not in the room on the pitch, mm. you know, Cause on that's the court. Because I would have thought, you know, you think about the usuals, the resilience, the teamwork and stuff like that, but yes. actually thinking wider about the networking, the opportunities that yes. leads to. It's actually really broad. The skills that you learn, just the confidence that mm. it builds. You learn about winning and losing and coping with that. So, you know, maybe putting yourself forward for a, a job mm. doesn't feel quite as daunting. Mm. And I, I think there are other things that can have... A similar impact but sport really you know it keeps you fit and healthy and we know that that helps you mm. you know helps your mental health helps your physical health it's going to help you you know we know that kids are more productive at school if they're more active in the day mm. so straight away you've got a bit of a head start but then all the skills that you're learning and the networks that you're making are very beneficial mm. And there will be other factors involved as well because there's also something about poverty and social status and what you're what you have access to. So it's all very well saying playing sport at school. You know, if you're in a private school and you've got every opportunity more, yeah. available and you know the facilities and so on. If you're in an inner city pri- uh, public school, that you may not have those same opportunities. You know, and we should all have the, the same opportunities. Mm. Um, so there will be other factors that come into play. But it is very clear that there's cause and effect. If you if you play sport, it it's giving you life skills, mm. particularly if you play team sports, that will help you in your future life. And therefore, if women are not playing those sports to the same extent as men are, Inevitably, there will be fewer women benefiting from mm. sport and reaching those higher levels in the rest of their lives as a result. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that um, I think the most important thing, which is some of the work that you guys do, or well, a lot of the work you guys do, is looking at the younger girls and, the, and some of the yes. barriers that actually come into play from such a young age yes. I can't remember what the stats are but as young as I don't know what seven or something like that is yes it's so we different. know that it's round about the age of seven or eight mm. that girls start to drop out from sport that? so before that age when we so we've done some work with the youth sport trust and when we've talked to very young girls about sport they don't 
kind of think about the, it's just something that they do you know mm. they run around in the playground they don't even think about it it's they're not having to make an effort to do that they're just doing it and then when they reach kind of seven or eight the boys continue to do it and actually do it more and they still don't really think about it they're just doing it whereas the girls start to something is happening that means they start to think that it's not right for girls to get hot mm. and sweaty that they're not supposed to run around in the playground and boys are not getting those messages at that age, but girls are. And it will be coming from all sorts of different directions, influences, yeah. different influences, exactly. But, you know, it's shocking, right? Age mm. seven, eight is when women start, girls start to learn that women don't What's play acceptable sport. in their mind yes. or not acceptable, yeah. And what's really shocking about it is that, that girls are at risk at that age of dropping out to a far greater degree than boys. Mm. So there's definitely something that's about gender there. Mm. Mm. That's so young, that's so young. Okay, a couple of things. An interesting thing I thought today is, and I often ask people about celebrating success, is how do you feel, or do you celebrate success? Because you're kind of in a career which, you said it earlier actually, you, you're getting moments where you're seeing progress or seeing change, yes. but there's always something to be done. And yes. are you able to like soak it up and celebrate what is happening, or does it, you just kind of stay on this? You know, you've asked me that on the perfect day because we <laughs> we had a team meeting this morning at Women in Sport. So once a month, we get the whole team together. We have our crew meeting, mm. and we spent the first half hour of it reflecting on our successes over the last few months. Mm. And I asked everybody to talk about their own personal achievements in the last couple of months. And one of the reasons that I did that is because we do not spend enough time reflecting on success, mm. and. Um, we should spend more, definitely. And I think working in a charity in particular, you know, we are fighting for every penny. You know, the money is tight. We have not got loads of people donating to women in sport. We have to work really hard Mm. for the money to do that we believe to be vital work that we do. So, you know, taking your foot off the pedal to reflect and celebrate successes feels like time that sometimes can feel like time that is not being spent on fundraising and Mm. driving the cause and you know so it's sort of hard to take that time out but it is so important because it's about keeping everybody motivated Mm. it's about recognizing you know where we are it's about making sure that we are doing the right things as well because we need to make sure that we are reflecting on what we've achieved so that we're not just sort of trying to reinvent those things Um, so really important and you know I would hold my hands up and say that I definitely could do better on that for my team Mm. you know to help them reflect on what we achieve we're a tiny organization you know we're 16 people but we do have impact on a national scale and I'm really proud of Mm. that and and my team deserve to be celebrated Mm. in terms of your personal journey have you had many people that inspired you or Um, maybe even mentors or people like that who whatever it is that they do something that makes you think right I'm going to keep kicking on on this yeah loads of people that have inspired me obviously I mean whenever somebody asks me that question the person who always comes to mind straight away is uh, the first chief executive that I worked for in the voluntary sector Delith Morgan so at the time she was chief executive of breast cancer Uh, breakthrough breast cancer she's now chief executive of breast cancer now which is a combined breast cancer charity recently merged um she has been appointed to the house of lords she's just this incredible powerhouse of a woman who has huge amounts of empathy um care compassion but is also very focused very driven gets results i mean she's just got this kind of dare I say perfect combination of being this lovely woman caring about people but also a you know at the same time able to drive people and motivate them and uh, and get results and I think she's just such an effective operator she really is and I often find myself thinking what would Delis do mm. <laughs> um And she's not kind of a formal mentor for me, and I don't see her as much as I would like now, but we are still in touch. Um, In terms of mentors, I mean, I I have had mentors over the years. It's really interesting. I know a lot of people say a mentor's been really important to them, and, you know, we talk about the importance of mentoring at Women in Sport, but I'm not sure that 
I've actually found in my career it's it's been much more informal contact and inspiration. I can't kind of say I've had one or two mm. mentors who've kind of taken me through my career. If I'm being really honest, that hasn't been my experience, mm. which is not to devalue mentoring in any, any way. Um, but, you know, I've worked with some amazing people and I am inspired by um, leaders in other sectors as well and... Um, you know the major social change organizations so there's just been so many people mm. um and not not just people that I that are more senior than me as well I'm often inspired by you know all sorts of people around me who do amazing things I have huge admiration for women in senior roles who have families mm. I don't have children and I genuinely just think it's remarkable mm. if you um, are mum and you have a job All the and your own life yeah, yeah. and you know I just think it's astonishing and it makes I mean there are two things that I often reflect on one is you know I have my own life issues to sort out mm. and a social life and all of that you know uh, I have a life outside of work but I don't I'm not responsible for kids and a family as well. So if mums can make it work, I should be able to yeah, make it yeah, work. Yeah. And secondly, I do often reflect back on that NHS experience that I talked about and that, you know, I think you have to keep things in perspective mm. and decision-making in perspective. Um, if, if I make mistakes in my job now, it's not great and it's not good for the organisation, but nobody's going to mm. suffer, no one's life is at risk. Whereas when I worked in the NHS, you know, yeah, to some extent, the stakes were much higher. And I think that helps kind of keep me a bit more grounded. Mm, that's quite interesting. OK, uh, other couple of questions on productivity. I do ask questions on like, I love um, productivity is my thing. And the higher you get up the chain, the more things you've got to manage. But sometimes other people are doing the actual task, but you've got to stay on top. Do you have any ways of working that help you get stuff done? Oh my life! I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> Is it spinning? Spinning this or whatever? So many plates, spinning so many plates. My head is so full of so many different mm. things and it is one of the big challenges as you become more senior and you're responsible for sort of oversight of things rather than the direct delivery of things. Um, knowing when to step in, when to let it go, um, keeping on top of everything. I mean, this is where you need a great team of people around you because it's not my responsibility to deliver everything my job really is to keep the team motivated make sure I've got the right people make sure that they're working efficiently and effectively mm. with the resources that they need where that's possible um, and that they can come to me if they need help and support but that I respect their expertise and I let them get on with their job mm. within a framework that helps everybody kind of know which direction of travel we, mm. you know where are we headed what are we trying to achieve overall but it's really hard and I'll tell you what kills me is email <laughs> I was saying this to you email before I came up. is I a emails. nightmare and I've kind of given up on it mm. so there may be people listening who think that Ruth Holdaway she never gets back to me it's terrible <laughs> but it's because I could literally spend all day doing nothing other than emails and it distracts your priorities mm. you know you start dealing with the things that are, that are other people's yeah, priorities because yeah, yeah. they're you know asking you for something so I've started just trying to ignore it mm. to be honest mm. I'm with you on that um, it's really hard if you could give advice to a let's say there's a youngster finishing uni or something now and they say well, you know what I fancy I could see myself in a senior leadership position I'm going to say it's a woman just because of the fact that we yeah. talked a lot what would be the one nugget of advice you would give her oh gosh well I'd say yes you can do it go for it <laughs> um, I think I would say do Stay focused on what you're trying to achieve and, and make sure you believe in it and you enjoy it. You're not going to enjoy every day and every decision, but the overall, when you're working towards something that you feel good about, because I think, yeah, for me, I've got to have that kind of wider purpose to the work. 
because then that gives you reason and purpose for when it is tough and it will get tough it 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 does but you absolutely can do it and you can get there I mean I think the other thing is be prepared for the knockbacks as well because it's not a straight path to the top Mm. (laughs) not in my experience certainly and life throws all sorts of things at you so I guess that's the focus bit you know Mm. just stick with it stay focused on where you're trying to get to and why you're trying to get there a um, couple of other last couple of questions I always ask these uh, I don't know if you listen to podcasts but I always ask a couple of questions um, one is if you were to reflect on your personal journey till to now and say what's the the one thing that's helped you be successful in something that you've done you know whether it's your career or whatever what's the one thing that you have that's helped you get you see that starts from an assumption that I'm successful well, yeah I feel like I maybe I'm not and I have so much (laughs) more to do and so much to learn and you know I sort of think gosh I'm not anywhere near as successful as I would like to be um but I suppose I'm quite resilient so and, and that can be hard and I definitely you know I've had times when members of my team have not liked me or I you know as I've indicated I've had to make really difficult decisions and maybe those haven't decisions haven't been well understood um and it's hard for me to not take that personally but I've learned over time how to remain resilient and I have noticed that I think I am a lot more resilient than some other people because I notice other people being knocked by things that wouldn't knock me. Mm. And I also do think that actually, horrendous though it was, my illness has made me very resilient because I was very sick and I it was a mental battle as well as a physical battle to come back from that. And I had to kind of use every ounce of energy and strength that I had to get through it and I did get through it and I think knowing that I've done that means that I know I can actually cope with quite a lot um so it's not to say that I don't get knocked by things or that things don't hurt me or that I don't take things personally I absolutely do but I will I'm able to come back from it and I think you have to have that if you're going to keep going and you know, be in a senior role and take leadership responsibility because in order for other people to be resilient, you've got to kind of show that leadership and you have to be resilient for them sometimes Mm. as well. But I think it is something that I noticed that um, I'm not sure resilience is being built in younger people. I feel like it's, it's important and I'm not sure that... You know, again it's why it's part of why sport is so important because it'll help learning to cope with losses will help mm. you know kids to build some of that resilience and I do find that sometimes that resilience is lacking I think and for me that's been really important that's fascinating I, I'm, I was just literally listening and I have questions but you know when you drift off because I think the resilience thing is such it's, I want to write a book and I'm taking some of the ideas as well that speaking to people resilience is such a powerful one that um, without that and I'll say the other one I'll say is relent, relentlessness which is just keep going towards whatever it yes. is and so one is almost like um, saving the goals and one is almost going for the goal as yeah, well yeah and I said before about I think I've got a lot of energy and mm. that was the other word that was going through my mind yeah, was kind yeah. of the energy I think you're right it's kind of having the energy to push forward mm. but you it won't all go to plan things will go wrong and you have to be able to come back from that mm. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Right, last question. We're going to round up. Um, advice to your younger self. Uh. So you could pick an age somewhere between eight and 16. So I don't know. That's kind of a critical development age. What's the one bit of advice you'd give well, to Well, I've answered this question before, and it has to be eat less <laughs> and be more active. <laughs> That is a perfect it answer. ridiculous, but it's so true. If I could go back and just like... Eat less, do 
more activity. It would definitely have helped me yeah. at this stage. There were, yeah, some personal battles that I yeah, probably yeah. wouldn't have right now. I've heard I some fascinating ones. I honestly would say that. <laughs> but yeah, all right. Maybe etch it in, like, maybe send back some sort of bangle with eat less. Yes. And, and, and move more. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Oh, Ruth, thank yeah. you so much for your time. You've been absolutely no, outstanding and me. great energy. Thank you oh, so much. Well, there you go. There you have it. Another interview wrapped up and great insight from Ruth Holdaway there. I have to say, I love the way she finished. It was so funny. Just we all have things that we, we should definitely do. I know there's a lot of things if I went back to my younger self, I would do um, to make sure that later life is easier. And I just loved her honesty and openness there. Um, I took a lot away from the interview. I think one is the the, the real need in terms of leadership um, on whatever it's going to be, whether it's an organisation, whether it's in your environment, whether it's trying to drive social change, is the reality that there's going to be some sort of sacrifice to achieve that or some sacrifice and commitment that's required. And, and sometimes, you know, with all the things that are going on in life, it can feel like a lot of energy. Uh, but that's where, you know, she talked towards the end about resilience, being critical, energy as well, to be able to to keep pushing. And I think that's something that, you know, I, I'm thinking about as I develop and more causes I want to support and, and really try and drive change. Just understanding that, yes, it's going to be hard work. Yes, you're going to have to dig in. But if you can really see that vision and, and want to have that impact, it can drive you forward. I wanted to also, you know, reiterate as well about the creativity. I know that I mentioned it in the in the early part of the podcast when I introed, but also I think creativity is just almost a foundation for us becoming our best selves. You know, this podcast really is all about how do we get the best out of ourselves and really find that. And I think when we tap into the, the best expression of ourselves, you know, finding ways to be creative. There's a great book um, as well by Elizabeth Gilbert which uh, you know she wrote eat pray love and this book is whole all about like delving into our creative pursuits to find like the best sides of ourselves and I think sometimes when we're at school and we're doing art and we're doing all these other things that we, we are really creative but often we can lose that a little bit in our journey but we can find ways to do it in whatever we do so I think that's a trait that would definitely take out and of course resilience 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 I think in listening to all these interviews the one thing that I took away from Ruth is resilience and you know whether it's as she mentioned through her health whether it's through her career um, there was that key theme that kind of went through and I do think we need to teach more young children um, and, and find ways to build that within people maybe challenge them more at a young age or find that way to get that in because I think resilience is critical I'd say that's the one common theme across everybody everybody that I've interviewed different journeys different experiences but that ability to be resilient in the pursuit of their goals is absolutely fascinating Okay, there we are. We're wrapping it up for another episode. I'm about to head on holiday, but of course I'll keep interviews and stuff going while I'm away. So keep in touch. And of course, if you're enjoying these, do subscribe. iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, everywhere. Um, all social channels as well. And any thoughts, feedbacks, ideas, or people that you think I should interview, do get in touch. I've got some nice ones lined up as well. Um, so can't wait to share them with you. Have an amazing week. Laters. <laughs>